Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, by the way, if you're like sitting way over there, you might want to sit way over here, because I feel like the, the, the center of gravity of the audience is over here, so I'm going to be aiming my, my voice over here, even though I'm mic'd. Um, so uh, I'm Arthur Dwyer, and this is Futures from Scratch. Uh, it says on the door outside, uh, shared future from scratch, and that's because I was too lazy to change the, the name of the talk once I realized there wasn't really anything super interesting about shared future as opposed to regular future. Um, this conference has been heavy on concurrency talks and uh, even uh, futures talks specifically. Um, I highly recommend many of those other talks. Uh, this one is going to be uh, much more uh, sort of basic. If you're looking for, like, you're going to go home and implement future for your employer, uh, please don't pay attention to this talk. Uh, if you're going to go home and implement it yourself and play around with it and, and sort of understand the, like, how it works, sure, this is a great talk. Uh, but this is not efficient. There's a lot going to be a lot of memory management going on in this. I'm going to use a lot of shared putters. Um, I'm going to implement a lot of efficient operations in terms of inefficient operations. Um, so don't take this as the way it's really done. Um, but uh, I'm going to show you how to implement futures from scratch. So first of all, what is our goal? Uh, before I even start talking about futures, let, let's just uh, define the problem. The problem is. Um, I want to compute some expensive sum of, of two things. So I take my inputs A and B, I do expensive computations on both of them, and I return OA plus OB, um, which are the outputs. The, the problem here is that I'm serializing my computations. I'm doing uh, one expensive computation, then the other one, then adding them together. That's going to take twice as long as it takes to do one expensive computation. Uh, if I've got multi-threading, of course, I can do better. Um, so I could do something like this, where I spawn a second thread. I run one computation in that thread, while my main thread does the, the expensive computation on B. Uh, then I join the thread, and then I return OA plus OB. All makes pretty, pretty much sense. This is manual thread management. This is like you know when I do a, a make a thread, and then later I join it. That's like newing memory and later deleting it. It's just horrible. Um, if you forget the join, I think it gets worse, because I think the destructor like, joins for you. It, it, it's hard to read, it's hard to reason about, and it's asymmetrical, uh, which I personally, I hate asymmetry. Um, you know, we have the main thread and the other thread, um, or I could spawn two threads and have the main thread do nothing, uh, which is actually what I'm going to do in a moment, so take that with a grain of salt. What we want to be able to write is something like this, right? Um, I just say, please asynchronously do this expensive computation, asynchronously do this other expensive computation, and then return uh, their results. Um, OK, let, let's try to get there. How do we implement this async thing? Um, OK, this, this is a primitive I'm going to take as given. Uh, we have a scheduler, fire and forget scheduler. Uh, it's some global object that uh, has some worker threads, and uh, you can call schedule. And you just give it a, a, a function that uh, takes no arguments and returns nothing and throws nothing either. That's going to be important. Just a, a unit of work. Um, and I can just say, schedule this unit of work for later, and it will take care of all the rest. It will make sure that happens at some point in the future. Um, Sean Parent had a talk uh, last year, I think, that uh, covered in detail like how you would do this with a th basically making a thread pool. Um, an earlier version of this talk, uh, I went through all of that, and it took an hour. So I'm not going to do that. Just assume that we have that. Um, OK, so now our code looks like this, right? Um, we uh, make up a couple of lambdas that uh, do the expensive computations. Uh, they don't return anything. They can't return anything. So we just uh, store the results into OA and OB. Um, and then uh, magic happens. And then we can return the results. I think you should be a little more explicit here in uh, step two. OK. So what, is the, what are those question marks? All right. I love metaphors. So we're, we're going to talk about how to deliver messages between threads. Um, we have our two actors here, Pat and Frosty. Uh, we have Frosty because I, I was looking for clip art of someone waiting for mail. And uh, this was the cutest one. Um, so Frosty is waiting for a letter from Pat. Um, Pat is going to deliver the letter to Frosty. Um, but Frosty is really lazy. In other words, Frosty could just check the mailbox every 10 seconds and just see if there's something in there. Um, and eventually, Pat's going to come along and put something in there. And the next time he checks the mailbox, he's, he's going to see it there. Uh, that's polling. Polling is terrible, right? It's spinning, spinning waiting for stuff. So 
Uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to want some algorithm that allows, some protocol that allows Frosty to just go to sleep. Um, just go to sleep next to the mailbox and uh, wait for the letter to come. So when Pat brings the letter, uh, well, she's going to have to wake up uh, Frosty somehow. Um, so here's what's going to happen. Frosty goes to sleep next to the mailbox. Pat comes along. Pat puts the letter in the mailbox, but Frosty is still asleep and doesn't see it. Therefore, Pat is going to wake him up by banging her cymbals really loudly. Um, that wakes Frosty up. Frosty looks at the mailbox. How does he know there's something in it? Well, when Pat puts something in it, she raised the flag on the mailbox. Yeah, that's the opposite of what she does in real life. But um, uh, So Frosty wakes up, sees the flag raised, knows that's the symbol, signal, also the symbols. Uh, he knows that's the signal for him to go look in the mailbox. So he goes and looks in the mailbox. Pat, by this time, is no longer touching the mailbox because she's already banged her symbols and she's left. So it's OK. They don't you know, bump into each other. They don't have one of those moments where they touch hands and it gets weird. Um, so uh, Frosty then has complete access to this mailbox, and he can open it up and take the letter out and read it. OK. Uh, so we can implement this. Oh, yeah, uh, also, uh, Right, Frosty is lazy, he wants to go to sleep, but you know, he is sleeping by the mailbox that's next to a busy road. He might wake up at some points, uh, so he needs to be able to handle these spurious wake-ups. Just because he woke up doesn't mean that Pat has come along and banged her symbols. It only means she's banged her symbols if the flag is raised. Right? If he wakes up due to some noise and the flag is still down, he can just go back to sleep. He knows it wasn't Pat, because Pat raises the flag. Um, right, and Pat and Frosty can't both be touching the mailbox at the same time. Um, OK, so here's what this looks like in code. Um, we have uh, a mutex and a condition variable. Every, by the way, who, for who is this not like a refresher? Who, well, OK, nobody raised their hand. So, this, so that means that this is a, wait, this is a refresher for everyone. Yes, all right. Um, all right, so we, we set the Boolean to true. That raises the flag. We notify one on the uh, uh, condition variable. Um, and then Frosty in the, in the main thread here is uh, waiting on the lock uh, in, a, in a loop. Right, okay. So the problem with this approach, notice that the, this, is, uh, this is doing our expensive computation, right? So uh, we do this for OA and then also we do this for OB. Um, uh, the problem with this computation, besides being a whole ton of boilerplate code, um, is that people move, um, right? Frosty is waiting for this letter. But he's waiting a couple of years, and in the meantime, he changed his apartments. And uh, Pat needs to know that when she comes, she needs to deliver the letter to, well, she thought that was where Frosty lived, but now he's over here, and, and it, it gets messy. Um, so we need to allow uh, the, the two sides, Pat and Frosty, to sort of move, um, move around, right? be passed around as arguments to functions and return values, um, but still be able to communicate with each other. Uh, and this is where futures come in or post office boxes. Um, we need a, uh, basically we need a post office box. We need a mailbox that lives at a known location. We're just gonna allocate it somewhere on the heap. And our two sides, uh, which I'm now gonna abbreviate F and P, and then I'm gonna re-expand out the future and promise, uh, they get to move around because they're just pointers. Um, but they hold pointers to a known location. Uh, these pointers are movable. OK, so now we're going to get into the, the part of this that is all code. And fortunately, it's all readable because we have a huge screen. Uh, but this is where it gets boring. Um, so uh, we have a shared state. Um, this is the object that's going to live out on the heap. It's going to be our, our post office box or our mailbox. And it's going to have these members. Uh, we're going to have the mutex and the condition variable and the Boolean ready flag. Uh, that's going to be our mechanism for transferring information. And we're also going to have um, a certain amount of actual payload here. Namely, uh, uh, we're going to have uh, something of type R. Like if I have a future of int, then R would be int. Um, and this is where I put the int. When I, when I satisfy the, the promise, I put the int there, and then the future can read it back out. I'm also going to put in something called the std exception putter, uh, which we'll get to later. Um, now, the, uh, the value and, and the exception putter put together, that's basically an expected of R. Um, as I understand it. It's certainly the same thing as a try of R in Folly. Um, and that turns out to be a very useful abstraction, um, which I am not going to use in this talk because I didn't have time to rewrite my slides after learning that. Um, and then our futures and promises are going to look basically like this. Um, I'm going to have a promise of R. It's going to have a pointer to the state 
In order to eliminate all of the tedious bookkeeping for this talk, I'm just going to make it a shared putter. Um, and it's going to have a member uh, called set value that takes an R, uh, again, for simplicity. I'm, I'm just going to take it by value. Um, and uh, it's going to do the, uh, you know, lock the thing, um, uh, set the value, uh, raise the flag, and then notify all. Um, or notify one. Let's say notify all because I, it makes things simpler. You don't have to worry about how many things you have. Um, the future, future of R is also going to have a shared putter to the state that, that's allocated out on the heap. Um, and when you call get on this future, uh, it's going to lock the mutex, uh, wait on the condition variable until the uh, flag is raised, and then it's going to give you back the value. Um, so th this is in a, a very, very high level simplified fits on one slide version of what future and promise are doing. They're communicating via this shared state that, that lives somewhere out on the heap. Um, okay, so here's the real deal, ish. Um, one level of, of detail down. What is promise going to do when you give it a value to set? Uh, first of all, um, if it uh, doesn't have a state um, at all, uh, that is, if it's been default constructed or it's in a moved from state, uh, it's going to throw. Um, then uh, we're going to lock the mutex. Uh, if it's already ready, uh, if someone has already set the value, it was probably us just a moment ago, um, we're going to also throw. We're going to throw uh, promise already satisfied. Um, and by the way, yeah, the, these are obviously not the standard version of this, right? I am too lazy to write the standard version of what we actually throw. What we actually throw is a std future error of a particular enum that's also defined in the standard. Um, and I am not going to write all that because that won't fit on a slide, but I will write uh, just throwing a string literal. Um, OK, so we've now established that we're not a moved from promise, and uh, the promise is not yet satisfied. And therefore, um, and we have a, a lock on the, the mailbox. Um, so now it is totally safe. We're the only ones with access to the mailbox. We can move the, the value into the into value. Uh, we can raise the flag and we can clash our symbols. Again, in real code, you would drop the lock before clashing the symbols because that's uh, more performant. Here, that takes two more lines of curly braces and it makes the font smaller and you wouldn't appreciate it. Um, we're also going to write this exactly the same function uh, called set exception that takes an exception putter and does all the same stuff but sets the exception. Um, and this is so that uh, we can also communicate not only the return value of the uh, complicated, uh, exp uh, what did I call it, expensive computation that we're wrapping, uh, we can also communicate if it throws. Um, I will also note in passing that set value and set exception are non-const methods. Uh, so this means uh, in the sort of convention that, that, that is developing about what does const mean, um, I cannot call uh, set value on the same promise simultaneously from two threads. That is undefined behavior. Um, I can call it once and then later call it. And as long as one happens before the other, that's OK. The second one will throw. But if neither of them is the second one, they bump heads, and that's a problem. Um, likewise, on the future, uh, oh, sorry, not on the future side of things. We're, we're saying, how do we get a future? Um, it's a little bit wacky that when you create a promise in the future, you don't create the pair of them together. Um, you create the promise first, and then you call dot get future, and that gets you the future. So it's possible to have a promise and then satisfy it by calling set value and only later get the future out of it. Um, and then you have a, a ready future. Um, but let's see, what are we doing here? Right, you can only get a future once. So when you call get future, again, a non-const member, because it's actually going to set a flag that says you've already retrieved the future from me. Uh, if you've already retrieved the future, I'm going to throw. Otherwise, OK, here it is. Future side of things. It also has a shared putter to the state out there on the heap. Um, it has a couple of member functions. One is wait. Uh, what wait is going to do is say, um, if I have a state, um, then lock the mutex and, and wait on the condition variable and, until it's time to wake up. Uh, wait is a const member function, so you can call it from two threads simultaneously. It, it's not doing anything 
uh, unsynchronized here other than looking at you know, the value of, of the state pointer, which is not going to change unless you are simultaneously writing to it. Uh, you know, and obviously you can't simultaneously write to something you're waiting on. Um, or if you do, it's undefined behavior because writing to it is non-const. Um, and then we have uh, this get uh, method, which is non-const, because with a regular old future, you can only get the value out of it once by value. Um, that's just going to wait, and then uh, it's going to either rethrow the exception, uh, if, uh, if there were an exception stored, uh, or it's going to move the value out of the place it was on the heap and give it to you as the return value of get. Um, so again, this is probably all a refresher. Um, let's see. Uh, the interesting thing about the implementation here, by the way, if you were to go play with this yourself, you can do a clever little trick here where uh, what I'm doing here is uh, uh, moving the state pointer out into a local variable so that as soon as I do that, it nulls itself out. Um, and then I can use uh, the, uh, the variable that I've got to, uh, to either rethrow the, so I still have a handle to it myself, but my object no longer does, so then I can safely like throw an exception or whatever without having to worry about cleaning up my object afterward. Um, bu -bu -bu -bum. What's next? Oh yeah, it's got a couple of utility functions. It's got valid, tells us whether the state, whether it's valid or not. Um, if it's been moved from or if it's uh, been uh, default constructed, then it's not valid. Um, and there's this other function that is coming under either this name or this name with is underscore prepended to it called ready or is ready. Um, and uh, what that's going to do is uh, just tell you if it's ready or not. It's kind of useful to know. It's a const member function. Um, and uh, you, you might have something conceivably where uh, what you wanted to do was, uh, you know, if I got a future that's ready right now, I'll just go ahead and, and do something with it. But if I would have to wait, well, I actually have some other stuff I could do. Now, why wouldn't you just do the other stuff in both cases? Some reason that, that I'm sure some people have. Um, okay, so that's all easy. What are we doing next? Oh yeah, we're gonna show how you use it, right. Um, Here's our compute expensive sum function. Um, and we are going to uh, make some promises, uh, get some futures from them, and then schedule two fire and forget tasks to uh, fulfill those promises by calling set value uh, with the results of expensive computations. We can fire and forget those. Um, then we just call get, which waits on both of these futures, and that gets us the answer. Right, uh, however, notice that uh, we haven't actually moved anything around. Uh, we didn't make Frosty go live somewhere else. We didn't make Pat go live somewhere else. We just took their addresses, so that, that's dumb. Let, let's actually uh, capture them by, by move using uh, C++14 in a, in a capture. So now we're taking the, uh, the promises that we created as local variables, and we're just going to move those into uh, the uh, fire and forget tasks that we're gonna send off to our scheduler. Um, even though our local variables are now nulled out, and if we looked at them, we would see they were not valid, um, the scheduler, you know, whatever queue of tasks it has, um, is still holding these promises, will still fulfill them as, as part of executing these tasks, and we can still see the result because we have these pointers to our shared state. Um, but what if we do this? This is another of these little corner cases. Um, what happens if we only sometimes satisfy a promise, a promise. And then other times, uh, we don't fulfill it, and we just delete it. Uh, we destroy it without having uh, fulfilled it. What do we do? Um, well, probably we go find the bug and fix it, but how do we know that we have a bug? Is it like undefined behavior or what? Turns out, um, no, it, we, we, will, we will be nice enough to our users that we will define this behavior. Um, whenever you destroy an unfulfilled promise, or whenever you overwrite it with the assignment operator, uh, or uh, any other way you could, you know, destroy the old one. I think those are the only two standard ways. It would be nice if there were like a reset method so you didn't just have to assign it a new default constructed one. But, um, you know, any time it goes away unfulfilled, uh, we say that the promise has been broken. Um, and so we, we just have this little abandoned state uh, secret wasn't enough room to write private, so I didn't. Um, 
Uh, what it's going to do is say, uh, well, if we're valid, and if nobody, and if somebody did get a future to us, then and we're not ready, then just pretend that we did call that function we were going to call, and it threw broken promise. Um, and then we make it ready. We bang the symbol, so the futures. Then, if there's anyone waiting, they wake up and they see, oh, I, I threw broken promise. Um, notice there's no way to distinguish. Uh, I mean, if you're all, if you are going to be using uh, promises and futures, calling promise dot set exception broken promise is probably terrible. But why would you do that anyway? You wouldn't do that. All right. So so that completes, by the way, uh, C plus plus eleven uh, future and promise for the things that they provide. Um, future and promise, not all of concurrency. Let's talk about all the rest of concurrency at this point. How am I doing on time, by the way? Awesome. Um, so we have a problem. The problem is we, we have this fire and forget scheduler, which by the way, we don't have, right? Uh, like C++ 11 and 14 do not give us the scheduler, right? We, we wrote that, but even given that we have that, that's a really fragile abstraction. Um, it requires a lot of uh, bookkeeping because we have to like generate these local promises and futures and pass the promise to the lambda, uh, the, you know, all that stuff I had to write before. It's a lot of boilerplate. And you have to remember that every time you call dot get, um, well, every time you call dot get, it might throw an exception. But every time you're going to um, actually do your computation inside this lambda here, um, you know, I have to set the value to expensive computation of A, but if that through, I need to catch it and set exception, right? So basically, this is what I'm writing, and I'm writing that twice. And everything in red italics is stuff that I really don't want to have to write, right? The only thing I want to write is expensive computation of A. Uh, so let's try to clean up all of that boilerplate. We have a solution for this. Um, uh, standard uh, packaged underscore task. You notice I'm using this convention of using all uppercase, uh, like camel case names. Uh, I should have mentioned at the very beginning. So I'm going to be using camel case names for things that like I'm implementing. And then if I use like std shared underscore pointer, you know that that's the standard one. Um, so let's implement package task. Uh, this is analogous to std function which I'm sure we all know and love. Um, but it's delayed action in that when I uh, call the, uh, well, you'll see. Here's how it's implemented. Um, it's going to store, actually, a std function, or something called unique function, actually, which is coming, I hope. Um, unique function is just like std function, except that it can capture, it's not copyable. Um, it, so that means it can capture things that aren't copyable. So that means it can capture promises, because promises aren't copyable. So you really need it if you're going to implement package task, um, which is why it should have come before package task. But now it's coming. Um, and it's also going to have a future as a member variable. And it's also going to have this promise already satisfied bookkeeping. Because as usual, if you try to do something twice, we're going to throw an exception to tell you you did it twice. Um, so when you pass a function into the constructor for package task, um, we're just going to do all that boilerplate for you. All that boilerplate was in red on the previous slide. Uh, we're going to set up a lambda that captures a promise uh, that also captures the function that you pass to it, that takes uh, some number of arguments and forwards them to the function that you just captured, the function you want to call, the wrap. Um, it'll set the value or set the exception of the promise. Um, and that's it. We're not going to schedule that anywhere. Um, but we're just going to make that a member variable, a little private member variable of our package task. And we're also going to get a future, the future of that promise. Um, when you call operator paren paren, op the call operator, on a package task, it will go execute the task for you. Again, not asynchronous. Package task is not doing anything with um, asynchrony. It's not scheduling anything. It's just doing what you tell it. If you tell it to go call that function, it will go call that function. Uh, if you don't tell it, then it won't call the function. Um, but that means that now that I have package task, oh, what else have we got going on here? Eh, whatever. We can use package task to build a safer abstraction. Safer abstraction is async, and it looks kind of like this. Um, so when I say async of a function, the first thing I do is I take that function 
and I move it into a package task, and I get the future of that package task, and then I tell my scheduler, which remember is not one of the standard things you get yet, but it's probably coming in C++ 17 with executors. Um, I don't fully understand executors yet. Um, but it's gonna be something where you can fire off things for execution. So we schedule this task for later. Um, whenever the scheduler gets around to executing the task, it's gonna call this operator paren paren. That's going to fulfill the promise. Our future is gonna see that result. So if you call dot get on the future return from this function on result, um, that will block until the scheduler gets around to scheduling your task. And that's what we want. Hooray, we just built async. Okay, we didn't really build async because uh, we, we didn't pass in arguments as well. So we need to perfectly forward those arguments to the underlying thing. Um, and that actually turns out to be really hard as I presented in the lightning talk just a moment ago. So I'm gonna skip all of these stupid hacks because we have better things to talk about. Um, okay, if you believe me that we can implement those, then hooray, we've just implemented uh, async completely from scratch. All right, so next fun part. Uh, let's make C++ look like uh, JavaScript, right? Um, we're gonna talk basically about dot then, by the way, that's what's coming. Spoiler. Uh, first of all, the, let, let's, uh, let's refactor this code a little bit to make it uh, easier uh, to, to use it as a building block. Um, so we had our set value, right, where uh, we took the lock, we see if the flag is up, and if it is, we throw. Um, and then we, uh, move out, uh, we move value and we set ready. And, um, but this is Pat looking to see if the flag is up. Now, Frosty never touches the flag. The only way for the flag to get up is if Pat raises it. Um, and Pat is unique, right? Promises are not copyable. You can't have two promises looking at the same shared state. And you can't move a promise from one thread to another without putting some sort of synchronization in there to get the value over there. So that means that uh, if Pat is looking at the flag, that's safe. Pat doesn't need to take the mutex in order to do that. So we move the mutex down. All right, and we do that in set exception too. Um, and then we can factor out that whole bit of like take the, take the mutex, raise the flag, no to bang the symbols, right? We, we just factor that whole thing out into a helper function called set ready. Okay. Now we can make set ready more complicated, right? Hooray for refactoring. By the way, who here loves refactoring? Good, that was a, that was a lot of hands. Um, all right, so now we have a single place that says set this future ready. Let's make that more complicated. Um, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna add to our member variables uh, out there in our post office box. Uh, in addition to uh, the value that we got or the exception that we threw, which again is the same thing as an expected or a try. Um, we're going to add a list of continuations. This is a list of unique functions. Um, again, fire and forget functions. These are functions that will not take any arguments, uh, will not return any values, and uh, will not throw anything. If they do, all bets are off. Um, these are continuations. So then, um, in our set ready, what we're gonna allow you to do with this new and improved future is uh, when it becomes ready, we're going to go and schedule on the system scheduler all of its continuations. We're not going to execute them, but we are gonna schedule them. Um, and then we're gonna clear the list of continuations and then we're gonna bang our symbols. Um, so, this is how we put something into the list of continuations. This is too much code for one slide. Um, but basically, we're gonna make sure that the future is valid. Um, we're going to invalidate it by moving its state out into this local variable. Um, and then we're gonna make up a task that will call uh, this function that we passed in. And we're going to give it um, this argument, which is star this itself, that is, when I call, if I have a future f, and I call f dot then g, that actually invalidates f and gives me back a new future which shares state with a promise held by a task on the continuations list of the original future. Did I do that right? No, the original promise. The original promise is held by a lambda. You know what, I think I have a picture soon, so bear with me. Um, 
If you're lucky, it's a picture of a cat. I think it's actually lines and boxes. Um, all right, once we have this continuation, uh, we're going to, uh, if the future is not ready, we'll just add it to its continuations list. And again, there's no uh, race condition here because uh, this is a non-const function. Nobody else can be touching this at the moment. Um, and then uh, we're going to, uh, oh, and if, if the future is ready, we'll just schedule it immediately, right? If you call then on a ready future, let's just like do the thing now. All right, what's our motivation? Our motivation is we have this compute expensive sum and now uh, we, we've done our asyncs, um, but now we're going to take the result of expensive one of A and call expensive two on it. So expensive two of expensive one of A. Right, if this is a recap, yeah, it's, it's gonna look like that, right? We're gonna make a future, we're gonna say dot then do this other thing. And I'll pause here because this may be unfamiliar to people who, have, who know then is coming but haven't seen it used. Is this, is this getting unfamiliar? See a bunch of shaking heads, all right. Um, so JavaScript programmers are cringing at the amount of boilerplate going on here. Um, the fact that I have to write this, like I write this lambda and then it takes x and then I have to call x.get inside the thing. Um, this is getting messy. Let's make C++ look more like JavaScript or like Haskell. Um, uh, somewhere in here I, I give a shout out to Travis, but uh, where is it? It's coming, all right. Um, what we're gonna do, we're gonna take um, ma, the, this, uh, this future dot then, and then a lambda. Um, we're gonna keep that lambda, but we're gonna make it no longer take a future. Oh, by the way, this, this auto is standing in for std future of uh, mid, just in case that wasn't obvious. What we want to write is something more like this, right, where the the lambda goes completely away because we already have a name for our function on values. We wanna take our function on values and kind of lift it up into the monad of, uh, of uh, futures and promises. We, we want to uh, make it a sort of meta function that operates on futures um, invisibly with this dot next thing. Um, and then we can just write this, right? We can just say async of the, of the first expensive thing dot next, second expensive thing. Um, and this is equivalent to calling dot then with the appropriate things and that's equivalent to scheduling things in the appropriate way to make sure that they get done nice and asynchronously. So implementing next is really easy if you don't care anything about efficiency, which I don't. Um, so the way I'm gonna implement next is as a wrapper around then that just copies all the boilerplate we saw earlier. This is horrible. If you're using a library uh, that provides you something like next, it will not do this. It will do something smarter. Um, right, yeah, so as Travis showed on too, that we can do this a lot more efficiently if we care to. I don't care to though, I'm, it wouldn't fit on a slide. Um, also, uh, in a paper, which I mentioned a while back, um, more improvements to std future of t n3865. Um, this is a, I believe, a current proposal, not yet in the concurrent CTS. I hope it comes because it seems pretty awesome, but I have no special knowledge. Um, oops. Oh, right, yes, it did change. Um, also provides this function named recover. Uh, recover is another wrapper just like next, except that instead of lifting uh, a value, it says, if an exception was thrown, then I want you to do this. Um, and this is even less efficient. Um, what we're gonna do here is, we're gonna wrap up this function in something that takes a future, and if it didn't throw, we're just gonna return x.get, um, but if that does throw an exception, then we're gonna call this func with an exception footer. And now we have something that looks like JavaScript. Um, because now I can just say uh, async of like build some string from some input 
And then next, uh, with the value, I want you to convert it to uh, a double. And uh, by the way, if either of those through an exception, recover by uh, giving me nan. Um, and so that this is, if the, uh, that n38865 uh, gets in, you'll be able to write this. And that's going to be kind of cool. And it's going to be efficient as well, I should mention. It's not going to be what I'm showing. Um, so there you go. That's pretty awesome. Uh, there's also one more bit of uh, uh, convenience wrapper. Uh, you can just say fallback to and give it a value. And that's the same thing as a function that just returns that value. Oh, and it looks, it's the obvious thing. All right, quick recap. So uh, I built you a promise uh, that has a get future, a set value, a set exception, and some private things. Uh, the standard one in C++11 also has a couple of very obscure features, a set value at thread exit, set exception at thread exit. Um, these are provided basically because it's implemented in terms of condition variable, and condition variable happens to provide you uh, notify all at thread exit. Um, so you can do interesting things when your current thread exits if you want to. Um, how that condition variable feature is implemented, I'm not sure. I would assume that it exists in the standard because it exists in pthreads. I'm not sure. Um, future. Built you a future that has get, wait, valid, ready, or is ready, uh, then, and then the convenience wrappers, next, recover, and fallback to, which are all implemented in terms of then here, but will be more efficient. Um, Things we won't cover, uh, wait also has variants, wait for and wait until, um, which exploit the features of condition variable called wait for and wait until. Okay, there's this other thing. Yeah, you know, you all came to this talk because it said shared future from scratch on the outset. I'm not talking about shared future. Uh, but there is also a member function called share that returns you, it invalidates the current future, and it gives you back a shared future, which is to future as shared putter is to unique putter. Shared futures are uh, copyable. Um, that should be here. Shared futures are copyable. You can copy them. Um, and they have a few other little quirks, uh, such as their get um, actually uh, is a const member function that returns a, a const reference to the shared uh, result. So that way you can call dot get on a whole bunch of shared futures. And they can all see the answer, which is good, because if you could copy it but only see the answer once, it wouldn't be very useful. Uh, you can also call dot then multiple times on a shared future, which allows you to make a sort of branching tree. Um, each of the children uh, will get its own copy. Right? You, since you can't copy a regular future, you can't attach multiple thens to it. Because then two thens would run, they'd both get a copy of it, you can't copy it. Shared future you can, so... Okay, I've said the word copy enough. Um, I was originally going to talk about when any and when all, but... Uh, they're not actually super interesting, and I'm sure you all know what they do anyway. Um, it is a little bit weird than the current, current uh, concurrency TS. Uh, if you call when all on zero things, it says all zero of your things are ready. Awesome. If you call when any on a list of zero things, it will happily tell you, yes, at least one of your zero things is ready. That's a little bit weird. I, as a math, math major, I'm not sure that that's really the behavior that would make sense. On the other hand, if I'm using it, that may be the behavior I want, because why would I ever want a future that doesn't become ready? I don't know. All right, so now I'm going to, we have less than 30 minutes, but hopefully 20 minutes. Uh, I just want to talk about something that I've also implemented in the repo, um, which uh, is kind of interesting. Uh, then with cancellation. This is something that uh, Sean Perrin also talked about in uh, Better Code Concurrency, um, but didn't provide like a, a, an implementation of. This is not a real implementation. This is a toy implementation. But just to show you like basically what we're talking about, um, the, the problem that I want to solve here is that if I have a future, f, and I say f dot then something else dot then something else dot then something else, um, I can set up a whole tree of work to be done. Um, maybe loading resources from files. And his, his example, it was loading uh, uh, pieces of an image. As you like, move around in the image, you want to start loading things speculatively. Um, but quite a lot of that work is actually turns out to be unnecessary. Because by the time it gets around to being scheduled by the scheduler, you've long since lost interest in it. You actually have other things you would rather do first. Um, 
So wouldn't it be nice if whenever I destroyed a future, when I destroyed the last shared future to one of these things out on the heap, one of these shared states, that would somehow cause the work to be descheduled, right? So I can, I can hold on to futures. As long as I'm holding on to them, the work will get done because I might call dot get on the future. But once all the futures are gone, and I can't get another one because you can only call get future on the promise once, so I know there will never in the world be anyone who is interested in this work, I would like to just drop the work and not do it. Um, now, I can't do this uh, in the standard, like under the as if rule or anything, because like the whole point is that I want to change the behavior of my program. I, I want to actually not open files I would have been opening. I want to not uh, you know, do computations I otherwise would have been doing. Um, so I want an observable effect on my program. I want it to run faster. Um, so how would I actually implement this if that's what I wanted? Uh, it turns out package task is actually the place that I would want to do this. This is where I pass in a unit of work and wrap it in a thing that does it. So if I want to sometimes not do this unit of work, this is the place to do it. I could try something like this. All right, this is very simple. I just say, um, I made a promise, I got the future out of it. I'm gonna pass that future back to you and you're gonna maybe you know, share it, make some copies of it. But uh, if at any point uh, the promise captured in this uh, work item I'm gonna schedule in my queue, if at any point uh, there are no more futures referring to that shared state, which is easy to tell by the way, because shared putter has this member called dot unique that will tell you whether it is unique. If I, if I have the only reference to this, shared, to this shared state, then there are no futures also referring to it. And so therefore, it is safe for me to not do the work. And I can just destroy the promise. Um, okay, awesome, problem solved, right? Uh, we have this, uh, told you there was a picture coming up. It took a while longer than I thought. Um, we have the shared state out on the heap. I have a future and a promise. Uh, I take the promise, I put it into a package task, and I move that package task over onto the queue of the system scheduler. Um, then, it gets more complicated, as I call f.then, or f.next, which wraps f.then. What that's gonna do is the shared state A has a list of continuations represented by this little gray arrow, which is an owning non-smart reference of some sort. Um, and I'm gonna put a package task on that list of continuations. It's gonna have a future, you know, where, where when this is scheduled, it will wait for the shared state, and that's why this is totally inefficient, because by the time it's scheduled, this will definitely be done. Um, and it has a promise that, al that allows it to satisfy this shared state of B over here, to which I have a reference G. When some task finishes, and this promise is satisfied, then as part of setting of calling set ready on shared state A, we will actually schedule this task. Move it down onto the queue. And at this point, um, it will run, it will satisfy shared state B. You will get the result. Okay. So let's say that if we're at this point where we have two of these tasks, we have some task, which is on the queue, but it hasn't been scheduled, or we have called dot schedule to get it onto the queue, but it's not actually executed yet. And we have this other package task, which is still living out on the heap in a queue somewhere um, in the continuations list. Um, and we drop uh, the ref, we drop G, we just delete it, we destroy it. So in this case, um, P2 is now unique. It has no extant futures. And therefore, when we come around to executing some other task, executing this, uh, this package task, it's going to check P2, see that there is nobody who cares about the result of the work, and therefore, it'll just immediately say, I'm done, nothing to do. Unfortunately, we didn't solve the, the problem of a big chain of work, because we're still gonna do everything up to that very last step and just skip the last step. So that, that's uglier. Um, we actually want a different system entirely. The system we want is we want to have the promise in the future both with their shared putters to the shared state. And then we also want the future to have this other idea of 
as long as there's a future alive, uh, it controls some cancelable task state. This is the state that I want to be alive as long as someone is listening, and as soon as nobody is listening, I want this to die. So therefore, the package task is only going to hold a weak pointer to it. There's going to be a single weak pointer to this thing, and as many shared pointers as there are Fs, or as, as there are futures. Now the graph gets uglier. This is the fun part there. It's like a, like a Mario level or something. Um, um, all right, so I've called f.then, and I've gotten a new future named g. Um, g has its own shared state. It's a shared state of b. Um, the promise for that sh new shared state is captured in a package task, which is currently on the continuations list of the shared state of a. That guy's promise is in the system scheduler's queue waiting to be executed. Uh, meanwhile, when this task gets executed, it's going to do some task on, uh, on nothing. Right? It's going to do some task. That's going to produce an answer. It's going to use it to satisfy that promise. Um, and then that's going to schedule this, uh, this, this middle walk. Um, and everything is actually held together. Oh yeah, so here's how we're going to implement this, by the way. Should be obvious from the, uh, from the arrows and lines and whatnot. But uh, we're going to take, uh, our future now needs two shared pointers. It needs the original shared pointer to the, uh, to the state where we're going to put the result. And it needs a cancelable task state, which is just a shared pointer to void that we can just set to whatever we want. You know, the, the nice thing about uh, shared pointers being uh, somewhat type erased is that you can just shove random things into them. Um, in fact, you can shove random things into the captures list of a lambda and, and end up with a thing that's just keeping anything you want alive as long as you want it. Which is where these arrows and, and lines really come in handy because then you get to... It, it took me quite a while to lay out this, this graph. <laughs> like, where, where, where do these clouds go? Uh, um, all right, so then with cancellation, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a task. Um, and uh, right, this, this is what it looked like before. You can tell by the number of blank lines on the screen. This is our old package task um, without any cancellation mechanism. We're going to add the following mess. First of all, um, I'm going to take this f that before I was actually capturing inside my package task, and I'm going to capture it somewhere out on the heap via make shared. And I'm just going to leave it out on the heap because that will allow me to delete it irrespective of when the actual package task itself gets destroyed. Um, and I'm going to attach that cancelable task state to the future. Then I'm going to capture a weak pointer to that cancelable task state. And inside the, uh, the package task, um, I'm going to say, if there's still someone holding a reference to that uh, the weak pointer, if I can lock it and get back something that's non-null, uh, then the thing I've gotten back is the function and I can call it. Um, otherwise, nobody has kept f alive for me to execute. Therefore, nobody cares about f. Therefore, it's a good thing I've lost track of it. I don't want to execute it anyway. I've snuck something into this slide um, because I have a vested interest in it. Uh, this s pointer dot unlock. Um, how many people know what that does? No hands. That's bad for me. Um, how many people know what lock does? All right. Unlock is the opposite of lock. It doesn't exist. I want it to exist. I'm going to go to Kona and I'm going to tell them to make it exist. Um, but basically, I have a shared pointer at this point that I've just made, and I really want to capture a weak pointer. Um, I don't want to capture the shared pointer. Um, that would be bad. I actually want to capture a weak pointer. Um, but I also want my code to fit on a slide. Um, and uh, therefore, wouldn't it be nice if there were some way to take a shared pointer and cast it to a weak pointer? Um, you can do it 
with cast. Uh, but that's a lot of code and you have to know what type it is. Like, notice here I didn't refer to the type FF anywhere uh, except up here and I wish I didn't have to do that. Um, in fact, maybe I don't because I forwarded F. I wonder if just getting rid of that FF would just make it work. Um, but anyway, I have a shared pointer. I want to capture a weak pointer. Um, it would be nice. Uh, so then what happens here, um, just to get back to the Mario level, um, here's our, uh, what happens when we call f.then. Uh, now let's suppose that we drop g on the floor. When that happens, um, its shared putters go away. Okay? Um, now what else in here goes away when the last shared putter to it goes away? Well, SS B down here still has a shared pointer, so it's still alive. But deleting this shared putter to uh, this actually kills it, so it goes away. So its shared putters go away. And we end up with something like this. Um, I've left the weak pointer arrows still pointing out there just to indicate that nobody knows about them. Nobody who just died is going to go set them to null or anything. But uh, you know, and they, and they do still control control blocks out there. Um, but uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, when you lock them, you get back null. So uh, that means um, that when we try to schedule this task, it will try to lock its weak pointer, it will get null, uh, and it will say, I don't need to do this work. And it will die, and that will kill its promise. Do I have a slide for that? Nope. <laughs> I just have Grumpy Cat. Uh, but that will kill its promise, um, which will kill shared state of A, which will kill the continuations list, which will kill shared state of B, and now they're all dead. Uh, and so we didn't even have to do either of those tasks. Um, we didn't even have to start executing this one to find out that nobody cared. We already knew. Um, when we destroyed this, it destroyed that, destroyed that, never even executed the code that locks, tries to lock this weak pointer. Um, you know, I put Grumpy Cat because I didn't think that I was going to get to the 87th slide. Um, but I just did. So any questions? Any unquestions? Oh, yeah, so the uh, taking the ready flag out of the mutex. Um, uh, so this is something that I myself was unclear about. Uh, so if anyone wants to convince me otherwise, uh, feel free. But um, so we had been locking the mutex and then checking the flag so that we could throw like promise already satisfied. You know, Pat has already delivered the letter. Um, but this is Pat doing the checking. Um, so there is no way for that ready flag to change while Pat is looking at it. Yes, yes, that is also definitely true. Um, yeah. Frosty will not be looking at value ever until ready flag is set. And Frosty's not going to know that ready flag is set until, at least until we set it, right? Um, and possibly not until we uh, do the, the condition variable notified to actually sort of propagate that change everywhere. Um, I, I was initially a little bit concerned that, uh, you know, uh, Pat herself, this, this particular promise, um, if, if it set the uh, ready flag, then it would know. It would definitely see that change. But what if this promise sets the ready flag, and then you stid move it over here, and then this one checks the ready flag? Well, they're still in the same thread, so that's actually OK. But what if you moved it across threads? What if you passed it to a function executing a different thread? And I don't think there's a way to do that without synchronizing those two threads. Um, so I believe 
that this is completely safe. Other questions? Alrighty then, I guess we're done.